Welcome to CO275 recording about uh, titanium mobile app development. In this session we're going to uh, have a little fun and we will uh, look at developing a simple game. Okay, so in previous sessions we designed this uh, very basic game of uh, getting an object to climb and we push the up button and then come down with the uh, down button. We did this by using events, specifically the add event method for a button or for a view. So let's uh, start developing something different this time. And uh, to do that, I, I'm going to still use my first app project, but I'll just go ahead and um, and uh, uh, delete uh, the whole thing and we'll just start from scratch. So let's go ahead and start uh, by building a window. Bar, this time we'll call it an actual window. Uh, in the previous example we used WIN, just the win name. It's really up to you what you will call this particular container. Uh, but so we need to create a window so we'll go ahead and ask the user interface um, to come up with a window. Create window. Excellent. And now some of the properties for our window are going to include background, color, and we'll go ahead and go with white. And uh, later on in this particular game, uh, you know, we could put an image and by the way, I, I will comment it out, but if you wanted to put an image, this is what you would do, right? And so maybe it's a soccer field or uh, whatever the background of your uh, particular uh, game um, should be, you would put the name of the image right here. Okay, so that's, that's how uh, this would be done. But we'll just stick with a white window. Okay, so let's uh, next create a frame. And this frame is going to basically fill the window and uh, the entire game will be inside of the frame. So we'll create a frame, maybe call it uh, uh, view frame, because when I say frame, in titanium it actually happens to be uh, a view. So ti.ui.createView, uh, this is going to create a nice basic container. So we now have a window, we now have a view, and we did not specify any properties for the view, which means that it'll fill the width and the height of our parent container of the window. Great. The very next thing that we want to create is some kind of a ball. And by the way, our game is going to be um, a type of a pong game. Uh, where a ball is going to be bouncing off the walls and we'll try to maybe bounce it back. So we'll create uh, another uh, view, we'll call it the ball. Okay. For the moment our ball, let's see, create view, for the moment our ball is going to be square. Okay, and we'll, we'll add some um, uh, rounding options to it in just a moment. Uh, but let's go ahead and maybe give it a, a color first. Background, color, let's make the ball blue. And uh, let's give it a width of uh, just 30 pixels and the height of 30 pixels. Okay, so at this point we have a square ball 30 by 30 right in the middle of the screen. Let's go ahead and see what this uh, what this uh, looks like. In order to make this happen on a mobile device, we of course have to do a couple of things. We have to add to the window the frame, then we're going to take the frame and add to it our ball. Okay, and after that we'll go ahead and open our window. Well, let's see how this might work. Let's go ahead and play this.
All right, it's going to be launched in just a moment. All right, so we have a white background, a square ball in the middle, and things are looking uh, great. Let's do a couple of things here in order to fix up the game. First, let's make the ball round. Uh, we will do that by providing border radius uh, property. Okay. Let me show you how this looks like. Let's go ahead and run it. All right, you can see how the square now became round thanks to the border radius uh, parameter. And let's see. The ball is right in the middle. That's fine. I want to show you something that uh, I didn't show before, uh, and it has to do with opening the window. On the iPhone platform, or also iOS, uh, iPhone or iPad, uh, you have uh, certain options that are not available on the Android, uh, specifically when you um, open windows or views or tabs, you have uh, certain transitions to work with. Transitions are a little bit like animations where they basically um, uh, give you a nice uh, look and feel. Uh, let me show you how we can open a window on the uh, iPhone platform with a transition. All we have to provide here is a property to the window open method where we would say transition and then let me just take a peek at documentation. Uh, the iPhone animation style is the particular um, container that has some of the options like curling down a window uh, flipping from left, flipping from right. Uh, let me show you what they look like so, um, so you will be aware. So let's start by maybe uh, flipping from left. Okay, We are opening the window, flipping from left. If, I'm tr uh, if I should try to run this in an Android simulator right now, it'll probably crash because this has no meaning for the Android simulator. But for the iPhone simulator, it does. So let's uh, try to rerun it and see what might happen. Uh, in with our app. Okay, notice the flip effect. Let's go ahead and uh, flip it f uh, differently, maybe curling it up, run it again, and uh, in a moment, again, the splash screen will, will come up, and now we have the curl up, and you can curl down as well. Okay, so for a game, it makes sense to have some of this uh, uh, um, eye candy. Here's how you can keep this in your code. You could say something like if uh, the TI platform OS version, oh I'm sorry, OS name, if it's reported as iPhone or, and in our if statements notice that this is the or statement and this would be the and statement. So or are two pipes and and A and D would be um, two ampersand signs. Uh, if you try to put A and D, this will be reported as, as an error. Uh, it actually would go right here outside of um, outside of the uh, double quote. So we have to put or TI platform OS name is equal to iPad. Right. And notice also the use of double uh, equal signs. If you use single equal sign, this if, if statement will always be true because uh, what you would be doing is you would be assigning the value of iPhone into a specific variable. Uh, so then you're not comparing the values. The if statement always uh, fires as true. Okay, so here's what we can do. You see we're creating an if statement will run this window open statement for iPhone and, or um, iPad, but then we'll use the simple open statement for Android. See, so that's how you can uh, implement uh, strengths of one device, like the curling of windows on the iPad or iPhone, but yet uh, keep the same line of code for your Android or BlackBerry devices. All right, so at this point we have a ball in the middle, 
of the screen. We have a frame. And uh, all right, what, what, we, uh, what we would really want to do is uh, make this ball move, right? What we'd like to do is have the ball maybe move on an angle, hit the wall, and then switch uh, its direction, and so it bounces all over the screen. Uh, we can get this done. So first of all, we need to establish the boundaries. So let's set a, a variable called uh, screen height. And I'm just creating this variable. And we'll go ahead and set the screen height from the uh, platform uh, display caps. Uh, let's see. And then platform height. So my screen height is important because when my ball uh, basically goes to the bottom of the screen and I need to know what the height of the screen is, I needed to bounce it back and to know when the ball has reached that point. Also, the screen width is important. So uh, we'll have a, a similar context here. Uh, okay, let's go here. And now we'll just say platform width. Perfect. So these two variables are important to us at this point. Next. The key to the ball moving is timing. So what we have to do is we have to have sort of a heartbeat enabled uh, on our application, uh, otherwise called a timer. And this timer has to be moving at a specific speed so that our application um, has some um, life to it. And so this is how we would create a timer. We would say uh, var timer equals set interval interval sorry move ball is going to be the function that gets executed with every firing of this interval and uh, we'll go ahead and set um, 10 uh, as far as uh, the number of uh, milliseconds so if I was to uh, put a thousand here it would be it, it, the timer would hit it, uh, and execute every second well, if you can imagine a ball moving, uh, you know, one pixel per second, that would be fairly choppy. Uh, instead, we'll move it uh, much faster, 10 uh, milliseconds per pixel across the screen. Uh, so this timer is going to go ahead and uh, have this kind of uh, 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 life to us. So now let's define this move ball function. Okay, move, move the ball. We want to say something like uh, function move the ball and this particular function is going to um, change the value for the top and the left uh, properties. So what we'll say here is we'll say something like ball and that's our frame ball.top equals ball.top plus one okay this should move our ball from the middle of the screen down now for this to actually work well what we have to do is we have to uh, define the top uh, variable ahead of time so let's just go ahead and uh, maybe set uh, the top of the ball uh, at the very, uh, let's see, middle of the screen, and we would do that by taking screen height, divided up by two, okay, and uh, then subtract half of uh, the height of the ball, which would be 15 for us. Let's see how this works. We execute uh, our uh, interval and then the move ball function. Hopefully our ball will be moving uh, vertically down the screen. There it is. Okay, so after the flip is done, uh, the ball is moving down, and of course now it's disappeared. We can track this ball by saying something like um, uh, ti.api.info ball.top. So now, as the ball is moving, every 10 milliseconds it's going to report to us its um, location 
So now we can see how many pixels up uh, this ball is, um, is, is located. All right, so with this ball going down, let's make the ball bounce. All right, how are we going to do that? Well, we basically uh, are going to change the direction of the ball when the ball reaches uh, a certain, uh, a certain uh, top values. For this to really make sense, what we have to do is we have to define a couple of variables for directions. Uh, so let's define a variable direction v. So for vertical direction, and we'll go ahead and start this direction with down. So to start with, the ball is dropping down, and uh, that's what's making the ball drop down. So we would say if direction v equals okay two equal signs and parentheses around this so if the direction if the vertical direction is down then you go ahead and, and execute it by adding one to the top of the ball all right so that's how the ball falls otherwise so the only other option for direction v would be if it's up. Then make sure that ball.top equals ball.top minus 1. Now what we need is a simple if, if statement that's going to define when the direction becomes down and when it becomes up. So we'll say something like this. If the t uh, ball top, for whatever reason, becomes greater than screen height right so we have the screen height variable if the ball passes the screen height then okay then make sure that direction v is now going to be up so this is what's going to cause the bounce of the ball a bounce of the ball because then the second part of the if statement is going to kick in. But we need another statement that will say something like if ball top becomes less than zero, right? It becomes less than zero. Well, in that case, make sure that we change the direction of the ball. Whoops, vertical direction is now going to be down again. Does that make sense? So basically, what we're doing is we're saying there is a boundary here. And when you reach this boundary, make sure that the ball is moving up. And if you reach the other boundary, make sure that the ball is moving down. And we make the ball move one way or the other, either adding pixels or subtra subtracting them from the top value. All right, well, let's see how this might work. All right, so that's a deep bounce. We might correct that in just a minute. All right, so it bounces off the top of the screen. It sinks into the bottom of the screen. Why? Because we are saying that the ball must be, the, the top of the ball must be greater than screen height, right? So instead, if we were to maybe subtract the, um, the uh, height of the ball, uh, then uh, let's just see what happens. I'm, I'm guessing that the ball is going to bounce a little bit more gracefully at the bottom. All right. Uh, so maybe uh, we subtract a little bit more than 30. Um, see how it still sinks a little bit. Let's make it a 50. Okay, the ball is dropping, the ball bounces at the bottom, and the ball is going to bounce off the top. Okay, so at this point, we made this ball move up and down. Well, all we have to do now is perhaps move the ball on an angle. Well, we'll just follow what we've done with the vertical move and uh, start creating variables for horizontal move. Direction H, or horizontal, is going to start as move to the right side of the screen. Uh, well, actually, let's see. 
Yeah, right will be fine. So we'll be moving the ball to the right. Then we have to define a variable that allows, allows us to do that, like the left variable. So we're going to now track the uh, x value of this view. Uh, the ball is, of course, uh, the uh, view object type. So ball left equals screen. All right, let's spell screen here. Let's fix that. Screen width. Okay, divided by two. And uh, let's see. Uh, what we're going to have to do as far as um, putting it just right. Um, Well, let's 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 try 50 at this point, and we'll we'll know in a moment exactly how wrong I might be. So we'll go ahead and uh, and uh, run this. Yeah, something tells me 50 is too much because the ball is only 30 pixels. Let's just try with 15. Okay. Yeah. So now we have the ball that starts somewhere. Uh, but we still have to uh, first change the direction. So the moment the ball hits the right side of the screen or the left side of the screen, we need to change directions. So we'll say direction H first is going to be to the right. And when that's the case, then we'll continually add pixels to the left uh, variable. Now, otherwise, let's go ahead and say ball left equals ball left minus one. Perfect. So now we have the ball moving to the left, but when the direction variables change, then the ball will start moving the other way. Okay, and so let's go ahead and uh, do it um, or execute the actual direction change. We'll say that uh, if ball, whoops, if ball dot left, okay, is greater than the screen height. And let me explain why I'm using the greater than symbol here instead of just equal. We are moving our ball one pixel at a time, which means that it has to go through all values. Technically, I could say if ball left equals screen height. Sometimes, though, what may change later on in our, in our software, we might be moving the ball every two pixels. And if this equation is missed, so that if that exact screen height um, was skipped because we added instead of one, two, then this if statement may never execute and the ball just disappears uh, into the margin. So the greater than uh, symbol is going to make it a little bit more flexible uh, so that any value beyond um, the margin is going to make the ball come back. And so uh, in the same way here, uh, we're going to have to correct for the size of the ball so that it doesn't sink into, into the side uh, window. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's subtract the, the entire width of the ball because we are measuring the left side, the left margin of the ball, so uh, we have to subtract the entire uh, width of the ball so it looks like the ball is bouncing off of the right side of, uh, of itself. Uh, okay, so that's what we'll do here, and we'll say, okay, once you are bouncing off the right side of the screen, then we'll change the direction, the horizontal direction, and uh, we really need you to go the other way, to the left. Okay. The next statement will say something like, if ball left oops, is less than zero, okay, then direction, please start going the other way. Let's see how this works. All right, whoops. 
Okay, so the ball is bouncing, uh, perhaps not exactly as I was planning. Uh, maybe the game should be trying to predict where the ball is going to appear at. So the phone has four sides and the ball is bouncing correctly off three sides. Three out of four ain't bad. Uh, let's see how we can fix our right margin. Uh, basically it's this piece, uh, no not this piece, um, we're bouncing right here. And what I will do is I'll get rid of this minus 30 and let's see what happens next. Um, this should correct it uh, to some degree. Whoops, I didn't like that at all. Uh, let's see what did we do here to make it angry. Let's run it again. Oh, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing this wrong. This is screen height. Uh, left, of course, should be the width. Um, there we go. And so at this point, subtract 30 from it. Uh, I think that's correct. Let's, let's try that. For some reason, I was looking at the previous line and just copying it, I think. All right, so now we have our ball bouncing off all four sides. Alright, so our game is taking on some shape. At this point, what we may want to add is uh, some user controllable device so that the user can actually move it back and forth and cause the, bo the ball uh, bounce um, differently. Well, to do that, of course, uh, we, we need to create a view, right? So, view is the basic container. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, create a view. Let's just maybe call uh, whatever it is that the user is moving. Um, we'll call it a bar. Let's get back to the code here, and uh, I'll keep our code arranged so that all our definitions are together. We'll do it right here. We'll say var bar, so we have a ball and a bar. Bar is going to be also a view, and this particular view okay, is going to have a few parameters. Uh, background color, let's make it black, right? So, um, the bouncing uh, bar is going to be black. Uh, let's just uh, maybe take width of a hundred pixels and then uh, the height uh, about 10. And uh, previously I set the top variable and the left variable outside of the ball view definition. Just to show you a different syntax, let's go ahead and uh, make the same um, <clears throat> same uh, property set inside of the, the create view uh, method. So our top, now let's make this at uh, screen height minus 50. So what we're doing is we're setting our bar at the bottom of the screen, right? If the screen height is maybe 320 pixels, we're setting it about 50 pixels from the bottom of the screen. And then the left, we're going to say uh, screen, oops, screen width. And that needs to be divided by 2 in order to center the bar. And we're going to subtract 100 from that, which is the width of the bar. So now we're going to, to center the actual bar. Let's just run it through the simulator so that uh, we, can see, um, we can see the bar. Well, that didn't quite work as well as I expected. The bar isn't showing. Ah, ha, ha. So why is the bar not showing? Even though we defined the bar, we actually never added it to the view. So let's say view frame dot add and add the bar to it. Now let's rerun it and let's see what happens.
Okay, so we have a problem here with an invalid dimension. Let's see. Uh, what did I break? Oh, I see. So these two variables are, are being uh, created um, after I'm trying to use them. So this is, makes it for a little bit messy code, but um, we basically need to have these variables defined if we're going to use the syntax that I was trying to demonstrate. All right, so now the bar is at the bottom. Uh, I didn't center the bar all that well. Um, it seems to me that the left variable here uh, probably could be 50 instead. Um, so as to center our our bar correctly on the screen. Okay, there it is. Okay, so the bar is down here, and right now the ball is going just to pass through the bar um, as if the bar was invisible. So what we have to do is, first of all, we need the user to be able to use the bar. Okay, we, we need to be able to use the bar. Move it. Because we're testing this uh, app in a simulator, uh, I'm going to use an event called the touch end, which basically allows me to click on the screen and, and move the bar. Uh, on the actual phone, it would be the touch event that moves the bar. Uh, probably you want to be able uh, to um, investigate other events that allow you to drag more uh, uh, with more flu fluidity on the screen, this particular bar. Uh, but let's just go ahead and, and stick with the touch end event so that we can click on the simulator and see what happens. Uh, let's go down here to define a new function. Uh, and this function uh, is going to be called uh, function move bar. All right, so we're going to be moving the bar. And uh, let's see. Let me show you this syntax where we will use an E um, object. Previously, in my move ball uh, function, I was saying ball.top in every uh, line because I didn't use, um, I, 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 I wasn't really using any other reference. But here, the user will be actually. Um, causing uh, as, as specific um, events to take place on the screen. So when the user touches anywhere on the screen, okay, this is going to create um, to create a, a, a touch event with an x and a y variables. Now let me show you how this might work. Uh, we're going to uh, log the value of x okay so we're sending to the log uh, whenever the user touches the screen we want to see what the x value of the of that touch is well before this will even happen we have to listen for that particular touch okay and so uh, let's um, perhaps do something like a window add event listener uh, make sure that we're listening for touch end and uh, make sure to execute the move bar uh, function. Okay, let's see how this works. We basically uh, are listening for touches on the screen and we, we're trying to report the X value. Okay, let's see. I should probably rebuild my uh, app from scratch for some reason. Uh, it's been exiting. Okay, so now when I touch the screen, notice that there are numbers that come up here in the console. That's because we're, we're using ti.api info and then log the x value. When I touch on far right of the screen, these numbers are high. When I touch on far left, these numbers are low. And that's how our screen tells us when the user is touching the screen. Okay, so to move the bar, right? To move the bar according to uh, where the touch is made, all we have to do is we'll say something like bar.top top equals e.y, 
and then var that left equals uh, e dot x. Now, if we do that, then the bar would be moved, or the left side of the bar would be moved wherever we clicked. It's probably more intuitive to have it be moved to the middle of the bar. Our bar is 100 pixels. So when I click, the middle of the bar will move to that location. It's going to be more, more intuitive that way. Okay, so now let's see how our bar is moving. There we go. So as I click on the screen, my bar is moving. Now, obviously this game is not as much fun with the ball not respecting the bar at all. Uh, we'll fix this in a minute, but uh, we can see that the bar is uh, now being moved, and uh, that, of course, is causing um, interact interaction, and, and the user is able to provide uh, some uh, feedback for our game. Okay, let's go ahead and move to uh, this idea of making the bar uh, a bounceable object. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Well, we will basically create a few more if statements, and these if statements are going to change the direction of the bar. All right? We have to do this inside of the move ball function uh, because the bar could be resting somewhere and it's when the ball comes on the bar it's when we want to be able to move it. Well, let's do it right here. Bounce off the bar. And so the first bounce will be the up bounce. So the ball is coming down and now we need to bounce it back. How do we know that the ball is meeting the bar? Well, if bar dot top is equal to ball dot top, and um, in this instance let's uh, um, add maybe 20 pixels. The reason why we're doing that is because by the time the top of the, of the ball meets the top of the bar, the, the ball is already sinking into the bar. In fact, you know, let me show you how it's done with, without correcting this first. So what we have here is uh, when the bar matches the y-axis, that's what we know so far. But now our bar is only 100 pixels wide. We need to allow the ball to pass on left or the right of the bar. And so we'll do that by creating the next part of the if statement. And in this part, we're going to limit the bounce only when the ball left, okay, minus bar left is less than 100. Okay, so this is what it means. When the left side of the ball, the, the value of it, numerical value, when we subtract the location of the left side of the bar is less than the actual width of the bar. See? So the ball is, must be passing right through the bar for this to happen. Okay? But also, when the ball left side minus bar left side is greater than, well, let's say, zero at this point, Right? What we are saying here is that, okay, what if the, what if the left uh, side of the ball is way before the bar even starts? Okay, then um, it will be a negative number. So the first part here is going to cause the ball to pass successfully on the right side of the bar, and this side is is allowing the ball to pass on the uh, left side of the bar. Okay, okay. let me show you how this works. In fact, uh, as I'm listening to myself, I think it might be best to divide this into um, parts and then implement them one at a time. Uh, so, so, you, you, so you know what, what, what we're doing. Okay, so uh, the moment this executes, we need to change direction. Change direction, well, if um,
let's just say for now direction v equals up right so what we're doing is if the ball is coming down we only are going to allow the up bounce let's keep it simple and let's uh, let's show uh, what we're doing okay so I need the ball to bounce off the top first and now I'm going to provide my my bar you see how the bar allowed it to bounce all right now our edges at this point uh, of the bar are not very crisp first of all the ball is falling too far below the bar right and secondly if you look at it I can have the bar way back here and it still bounces <laughs> right so why does that happen well it happens because so far I'm only checking that the top of the that the top of the ball happens to be equal to the top of the bar and then I'm changing the direction of the ball so the first step let's make sure that um, that when the ball bounces okay when the ball bounces let's make sure that the ball bounces at the bottom of its own width okay let's see how this will work uh, we'll make it come up here okay All right you see that the ball is now not sinking underneath the bar All right and so that's what this plus 20 uh, does all right, so just for uh, the efficiency of it, what I will do is um, I'm going to comment out this particular curl. I think that it's causing the simulator to uh, choke a little bit. Uh, we'll just open the window normally. Uh, okay, and let's go back here. And now let's enable okay, that second part. And that means uh, being able to pass the ball on the left or on the right if the coordinates of the ball are not um, are not uh, uh, firing collision there you go so we just passed the ball on uh, the right and now we just did that on the left so we'll, we'll put it right here you can see it passes but if I put the bar right underneath the ball the ball is going to bounce okay all right, we have a couple of other edges that we need to polish. See, if I do this, the ball still passes uh, on 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 uh, the left, and if I put my uh, let's see maybe this way, uh, let's see if I can demonstrate the right edge. Okay, that part is working. So we have to adjust this the, the left edge. Basically, uh, when the ball is coming down, uh, well, you're going to have to trust trust me on the fact that uh, there's a uh, <laughs> there's a possibility of the ball actually crossing right through the edge, which visually it, it doesn't make uh, sense to the user why that will happen. But that's because we are actually measuring the left edge of the of the uh, bar and um, and uh, and the left edge of um, of the ball. So to fix that, we actually what we have to do is we'll just go ahead and say right here minus twenty. Okay, so that's going to fix that little inconsistency. Okay, so now we have the ball bouncing. Uh, let's see. What I'd like to do is maybe allow the ball also to bounce from the bottom of the bar, okay? And uh, and we can get this done fairly um, efficiently by saying this: if the direction of the ball is down, okay, then obviously we want to be able to bounce up. All right, bounce up. All right, let's see what happens here. I don't know what happened to my if statement here. There we go. Okay, so then we bounce up. 
Otherwise, if the ball is basically already going up, okay, if the ball is already going up, then uh, we want to make sure that the ball is going to go down. So this defines a bounce from the bottom of, um, of the bar. Let me show you how that works. Okay, so here is uh, a bottom bounce, all right? There's the bottom bounce, and now we'll let the ball go up, and uh, let's make, oops, there we go, and here's an up bounce. So now the ball is bouncing uh, from the top and from the bottom, and of course our game is, uh, uh, the game is on. To make the game uh, more fun, uh, we might implement some scoring. So, uh, for scoring here to make sense, perhaps we can we could be counting the number of bounces that the user is performing. Okay, we'll count the number of bounces, and then we'll give the user only limited time to actually play a session. All right, and here is how we would do that. We're going to uh, create uh, a little score area. This is going to be a label. We'll call it score. Uh, we'll uh, use the user interface create label. Okay, like this. And this particular label is going to go right on the bottom of the screen and uh, maybe 10 pixels from the left side. The height of the label will be about 20. Uh, the width also 20. We'll just put a few numbers there. You know, you might be able to bounce 10, 20 times within a period of time. So we don't need that just to be very wide. And uh, let's make it black in terms of um, in terms of the color. Okay. And then uh, let's see. Let's make the text of the label start at zero. So there's going to be zero bounces to start with, and then we'll grow from there. Then the next element is going to be um, our time display. So the time is going to be also a label. Uh, create label. Create label. Uh, let's see. All right, create label. And now this label is going to be also on the bottom, right next to the other one. This one will start at 30, just because 10 and 20 uh, of left and width is going to uh, put it right next to it. Let's make the width a little bit bigger because we'll have um, uh, milliseconds scrolling here, so we need a little wider window. Now let's make this maybe uh, blue, blue in color. And um, let's start maybe with uh, 10,000. So we'll give a 10 second uh, session time. Okay, so that works fine. All we have to do now is when the timer is running, okay, when the timer is running, we need to be able to increment uh, the count. So this is how it's going to happen. Uh, we go back to the move ball function, and we'll say something like um, time dot text equals time dot text minus one. All right. So now, from the ten thousand milliseconds, every time the timer fires off, we're subtracting one. So we know that when the, the timer runs out, uh, we, we want to finish the session. So we'll say something like if time.text is less than one, okay, then make sure to maybe show something to the user like an alert and we'll say your score is, right, followed by score.text and then here we'll reset the timer where we'll say uh, say time.txt equals 10,000 again. All right, 
and uh, of course score that text equals zero again. So we, we will just reset the session for the user. Okay, um, so the timer goes down. Um, let's go ahead and run it. This basically is going to create a game where we are unable to score any points because at this point, nowhere in the code did we specify how the user will be scoring those points. And same errors as before, I need to be able to add to my window uh, those objects that I'm that, that I'm putting together. So uh, let's see where did I uh, have the sections right here. Let's move this section down here right before opening the window. Perfect. And so now what we'll do is we'll say view frame add. We need to add the score and view frame add, we need to add the time, which is the little timer uh, label. Okay, so let's give it a moment. Okay, so the score is zero and you can see the timer uh, going down. Well, I think 10, well, I might have recalculated um, miscalculated that. I think that's more than 10 seconds. Uh, let's uh, reset. Um, let's get rid of one of the zeros there. Uh, it probably will make better sense to have um, to have a variable somewhere at the very top that uh, sets it in both places. Uh, but we'll do it just this way. So 10 seconds is is 1,000. Okay, that's fine. So now we have 10 seconds. How does the user score? Well, user scores when a bounce takes place. Now you could specify to score only on the up bounce or on either bounce. Now let's just do it for either bounce. We'll say score dot text equals score dot text plus one. Excellent. So we go ahead and execute it and see how our score is uh, increased. All right, so there it is. Now let's go ahead and score once. There it is. There's scoring two, three, and your score is four. All right, we'll say okay. And uh, we might want to be able to uh, reset the timer when that happens. <laughs> okay, so uh, if, if we basically allow the score to uh, be on the screen for too long the score is reset but the timer automatically goes down okay let's see how we're going to fix that um, right here the timer goes down all the time and um, and the score is reset um, but the timer doesn't really reset because it continuously, yeah, that makes sense. It, it, it is getting overwritten continuously. Uh, we don't have to use the alert box. We could use some other object. Um, we could use a different type of an alert box to fix that. Um, let's see if this simple override might do it. If we just say else here and do that. Let's see if that might fix it. Okay, so the timer is running and we're playing the game. Oops. Alright, again, this many bounces. Okay, and so obviously the timer continues to run even though uh, our game. Hmm. All right. Well, I think this project is where I wanted to take it uh, in terms of just showing the basics of of a game. Um, if you want to improve on it, uh, feel free. Uh, basically, you could add a pretty picture background. Uh, you could uh, improve the way we are showing these scores. We could have a leaderboard where basically we have a local database where we uh, track all the scores. Perhaps the 
uh, leaderboard could be shared through um, an RSS feed and, and basically we could have multiple users um, competing. Uh, so from here you can uh, uh, use your imagination to make this game into uh, anything that you want. So thank you for your attention and in this recording I just showed you a little bit um, free uh, freeform programming of uh, writing um, a relatively ugly code. Um, you see this code has very few uh, comments. This code uh, you know, really needs to be cleaned up to be a readable code and maintainable code. Uh, we might choose to move some of the code into uh, external files um, and uh, definitely add comments to show what is taking place. Uh, but that's our game, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.